That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the lake. It was the Sabbath, and Jesus and company had been walking. As they were walking, some of the disciples had plucked the head off of pieces of grain and ate them along the way. The thing is, people had noticed, and people were complaining. They were complaining that Jesus' disciples had worked, since harvesting was work, and thus they had not kept the Sabbath. From there, Jesus went to a synagogue, where he healed a man with a withered hand. And yet again, those present protested, saying, Look, he has not kept the Sabbath. Healing is working, and working is not allowed. Again, Jesus healed another man, this time one possessed by a demon, as well as being blind and mute. Not only did Jesus heal him, but he also began to lecture and teach the large crowd that was following him around. Jesus was quoting from the prophet Isaiah. He was retelling also the story of Jonah and the Ninevites. And then Jesus widened the call and the scope of the audience of his community when he said, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Considering all these things that happened that same day, we can see that each of Jesus' offenses, for lack of a better word, gets bigger, first working, then healing, then healing, and working. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the lake. To be honest, Jesus probably just needed a minute. Seems to me that Jesus kept trying to get one point across throughout all of these exchanges, that the spirit of the law and the word of the law might not always match. The disciples had pulled a snack, and Jesus had healed two people. And the Pharisees, however, were livid that the commandment was broken and not thankful that these people had been cared for. So in short, it's already been quite a day for Jesus, walking and talking with the disciples, defending himself against the Pharisees, lecturing to the crowds, healing two different people, recounting the Old Testament. And this happens all before we arrive at our gospel today, where here Jesus sits by the lake and tells a parable. Consider yourself for just a moment. Consider yourself and the many different kinds of people that you talk to in a day or in a week. Family members, siblings, parents, colleagues, co-workers, friends, bosses, children, grandchildren, etc. Consider how you talk to each and every one of those people might be a little different. For example, my conversations with my nephew typically need a little translation before I can work them directly into a sermon. Otherwise, the words cool or awesome would be used a hundred times per sentence, and there would inevitably be the inclusion of his favorite joke, which is, how do you know if your rear end is broken? It's because there's a crack in it. But I share this as a simple and silly example, that we talk to different people in different ways, communicating at different levels. They are all true, I mean, well, that is true if the speaker is true, hopefully unless your speaker is unreliable. Though the information is presented in different ways to different people. As our gospel reading begins that same day, here Jesus launches into a parable, which is a tool of communication that he has not yet used that day, according to the account of Matthew, who is our author. But before examining the parable itself, I'd like to jump into what is not in front of us, and that is verses 10 through 17 of Matthew's 13th chapter. Because this section, which is edited out of our lectionary reading, begins with a pretty big question. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? The disciples are asking a simple yet Big question. Why, Jesus? Why do you tell us these stories 
instead of speaking clearly and defiantly at all times. Jesus responds by quoting actually from the sixth chapter of the prophet Isaiah, Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused, they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Jesus knows that sometimes we cannot hear things that are right or good for us. Jesus knows that sometimes life has hardened our hearts to hearing certain messages or things from certain people. We also know that sometimes God hardens our hearts, which keeps us from seeing the bigger picture, like was the case with the Egyptians right before the Exodus. Or consider this. Consider hearing a very solid argument from someone who you do not trust or respect or care for very much. Maybe they're on a different side of whatever the issue is. Now, no matter how good their line of conversation is, it's going to be hard to swallow to accept it simply based on who is saying it. Or have you ever been in a car and in an argument with one of the passengers when they tell you where you should turn? And you don't take their advice. No, 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 that's not the way. Only to realize later that they were right and you have to turn around. How hard is it then to say, well, no, I guess you were right. There are a lot of reasons in our lives that we become calloused. But here it is, that same day. That same day that Jesus has spent the entire morning with people misunderstanding his point that the feeding and healing of people is not disrespecting and breaking the commandment, but it is instead living out the spirit of the law and the ministry of God in community. That is the reoccurring point that I find in the 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And so now here in chapter 13, Jesus is changing up how he is speaking to the crowd in hopes that by changing his delivery, he might increase his effectiveness. This is where I will include my standard bit about the difference between parables and fables. Fables invite us into complexity and wisdom as a way to understand something simple. Hearing a parable is like stepping into a river. Our experience will always be a little bit different. Fables, on the other hand, move us to one point. To borrow his best-known phrase, it's the moral of the story, as Aesop would say. Well, that and fables always have talking animals, which I think are sorely lacking in the Bible, because Jesus never starts a parable, an ostrich was talking to a rhinoceros. Now, Martin Luther himself loved fables. Aesop was Luther's most quoted non-biblical source. Addressing that very topic, Luther once said, It is a result of God's providence that the writings of Aesop have remained in the schools. Aesop contains the most delightful stories and descriptions. Moral teachings, if offered to young people, will contribute much to their edification. In short, next to the Bible, the writings of Aesop are, in my opinion, the best. That's really high praise from Luther. But it makes sense. The direct point and straightforward nature of fables, mixed with the connection that people of all ages and stages can make with them, inspired Luther, who was constantly seeking new ways to bring the truths he found in the gospel to all people. But let's return to Jesus. It is on that same day. Jesus is face to face with a large crowd and begins to speak to them in parable. He knows that having others arrive to a conclusion is far more effective than simply telling people what his conclusion is. He knows that there are a lot of ways to hear what he is saying, and that there are many lessons that he is trying to teach. So he told them many things in parable, saying, A farmer went out, 
to sow his seed. Parables, like fables and metaphors for that point, always break down at a certain point. No example is airtight. There are always questions that the parable or the fable or the metaphor is not ready to answer. For example, well, with the bird snatching away the seed being seen as the devil, what about the other things that snatch away the joy? Are there things like squirrels that snatch away our seed, and what would those be? Or is it better to produce 30 or 60 or 100 yield or is it better to produce 10 yield if I used to be thorny ground? Or, to build off of that, if I feel like thorny soil today, what are the steps that I need to turn in to good soil? These kinds of questions are why Jesus takes eight verses to explain his use of parables, to make wise the simple to help people hear lessons beyond their bandwidth, to invite others into the story that he is telling. It's after all of this that Jesus then tries to clarify some bits of the sower parable. But again, every time we step into a parable, we can hear it a different way. So I'd like to offer you another approach to the parable of the sower. The kingdom of heaven is like a sower spreading seed to all people and in all places, over and over again across all terrain, knowing that different seeds will take root in different places, and yet a harvest will be plentiful. Or how about this? The kingdom of heaven is like a sower who commissions others to spread seed across all kinds of terrain paths and rocky soil, thorns and good soil. Though when some of those commissioned ask the sower, why waste the seed on the paths or the rocks or the thorns? The sower simply replies, your job is to spread and my job is to grow. Amen.